Learn Talks. We're so glad you could join us both in person and All right, so not other announcement, I just also want to announce that this Friday, the 13th, there's actually going to be a showing here at Tufts of Naomi Klein's new movie, This Changes Everything, which I'm told might be subtitled something like Capitalism Versus the Climate. And that's in Olin, the building called Olin, room 12, from 6 to 9 p.m. It's a wonderful opportunity. There's not that many screenings of this new movie, so it's a great opportunity to see see the movie and hear some discussion afterwards with some like-minded Tufts students. Great. And now I'm very pleased to announce our speaker, Philip Warburg, who is an author. He graduated from Harvard with his bachelor's in social studies in 1978. He worked for a few years at the staff of U.S. Senator Charles Percy, creating renewable energy legislation. He then attended the Harvard Law School and worked in D.C. at the Environmental Law Institute. Spent two years as a reporter in the Middle East, and then worked as the leader of the Israel Union for Environmental Defense for a number of years before returning to be the president of the Conservation Law Foundation here in New England. And he's the author of two books, Harvest the Wind and Harness the Sun, which we'll be hearing about today. Thank you so much. We are so excited for your talk. Do we have the the, the mug? Uh, we have a mug that we'll have for you later on. Well, it's great to be at Tufts. Um, I have to say that, that coming for this talk has one distinct advantage over most of the other talks I've given on this subject, and that my carbon footprint coming from Newton to here was much, much smaller than my carbon footprint has been traveling to various places to talk about my currently favorite subject, um, solar energy. Uh, we're up, okay. Um, I wanna start by just asking how many of you or your families have solar arrays on your roofs? One, how many of you have neighbors with solar on their roofs? Okay, well soon those, those uh, numbers I think are going to go up dramatically. Um, but what we're really finding is that solar is very quickly becoming part of the fabric of our lives, whether it's through our own individual investments in solar power or whether we're part of a broader community that has decided that solar power um, really is a technology that makes a difference and is a worthwhile investment. And by worthwhile investment, I mean a number of things. Some people invest in solar simply because it is a great way to reduce your monthly electric bill and to hedge against higher electric prices going into the future. For some, it's a way to chip away a little bit at your carbon footprint. And for others still, it's a way to kind of take charge of at least a portion of the power that you consume in your daily lives. And that particular aspect of solar kind of interested me as I traveled the country talking to various people. We're accustomed to thinking of solar power as the domain of progressive enlightened environmentalists. But what I found when I was traveling in the country was that um, there's a very strong element computer. on the right wing of the political spectrum, the libertarian wing, which is also ardently in favor of solar power. Uh, people like former Congressman Barry Goldwater, he served as a congressman from, uh, from California for a number of years. He now lives in Arizona, and he heads up a group called Tusk, Tell Utilities Solar Won't Be Killed. And the idea of this group is to defend homeowners' rights, and business owners' rights to have solar on their properties and to sell their excess power back to their utility at what they consider to be a fair rate, which is the retail rate for power. Um, and I have to say, it encouraged me to find that in this very fractious political era, there's at least some, perhaps narrow, basis for common language and common cause across the political spectrum, or at least from elements of, of the political spectrum. Um, when I was finishing my book on wind power, Harvest the Wind, in 2012, the predictable question that people asked me was, um, 
so will your next book be about solar? And at the time, my response was a flip and dismissive one. I said that if I ever wrote a book about solar, I'd have to call it Dim Sun. And the reason I said that was because at the time, solar just seemed to be pricing itself out of the mainstream market. It was hard for me to imagine that solar really would catch on and be a force to be reckoned with the way that wind was already becoming a force to be reckoned with. Um, happily, I was proven wrong. And um, as you can see from this chart, uh, from the first quarter of 2012 to the first quarter of 2015, the prices of solar power came down dramatically in all of the major sectors. In the residential and utility sector, the price came down by about 46%. And in the non-residential sector, which is the commercial sector, public buildings, et cetera, it came down about 52%. So that has helped enormously to make solar a more appealing option. A whole range of federal, state, and local policies have also move solar, solar forward, and we can talk about some of those. Um, but another indicator of the fact that solar's time has arrived um, can be found if you look at new installed electric generating capacity during the first half of 2015. From January 1 to the end of June 2015, 39 percent of all new installed electric generating capacity was solar, 39 percent. Another 36% was wind. So if you add those two up, you get to 75% of new generating capacity coming from renewable energy. And we think of gas as the kind of seductively cheap, superabundant resource with fracking even more so um, that can buy us some time until we make up our minds how we're really going to get serious about addressing the challenge of climate change. Um, gas during that same period accounted for about 21.4% of new installed electric generating capacity. Now that trend may not be a consistent trend over time, but it is an indicator that solar is a significant player in the landscape today and it's becoming more and more of a player as we move forward. Um, my own personal journey with solar power uh, began in the spring of 2013, when my wife and I decided it was time to walk the walk as well as talk the talk and put solar power on our roof. It was a cold March day um, when the Sunlight Solar Energy crew showed up at our doorstep. I frankly was amazed to see them there because two days before we had had one of New England's legendary snowstorms, um, not quite as legendary as last year's. Um, Fortunately, there had been a thaw right after, and the roof was clear, um, so they were ready to go, or at least they thought they were ready to go until they looked at our roof. Uh, Liam Madden, whom you see here, is a uh, Iraqi war veteran. He served in a Marine Expeditionary Unit. He's kind of a tough guy. But I saw him look at our roof and blanch, and the reason he blanched is that our roof has a 55-degree slope. And I said, have you ever installed on a roof this steep before? And he actually shook his head and said, no, you really hadn't. So he climbed up on the roof, and together with his teammates, they were all roped to the peak of the roof like rock climbers. They didn't say a word. And cars were stopping to watch them and to film them. And by the time they were done, we had a solar array that now gets us about 75% of our total power needs from the sun. And that includes the nightly charging of a plug-in electric vehicle. So it has made a big difference in our lives. And one of the inter interesting things about photovoltaics that some of you probably know is it's drawing from the sun's light, not from heat. So it actually works very well in a cold and fairly sunny climate like New England. Um, and here you can see uh, some interesting numbers. Um, Germany, just so you know, is the world leader in installed solar capacity, both in absolute terms and as a percentage of its total power supply. They get about 7% of their total power right now from the sun. And I don't know how many of you have traveled to Germany, but it's not the sunniest place on earth. And you can see that from the number of uh, sunlight hours in a couple of German cities that I put up here. About 1,500 tends to be where the sunlight hours hover in major German cities. If you look at Boston, we have significantly greater solar resources. Even Burlington, Vermont, and Portland, Maine, I'll come back to them a little later, have significantly greater resources. And 
so again, because photovoltaics are drawing on sunlight and not on heat, it is a resource that we can really tap in superabundance across the entire nation. Um, we are by no means alone in having solar on our home. Um, there are about 700,000 Americans now with solar on their homes, uh, and that number is going up very rapidly. Um, and businesses are also putting lots of solar on their homes. And um, during 2014, a new solar installation went online about once every 2.5 minutes. So it's really happening at an impressive pace. And it's not just happening on homes, it's happening on big box stores like Kohl's, like Ikea, like Walmart. Walmart, which at least I don't think of as a paragon of uh, environmental or civic virtue, has decided that solar is a way to go. It has solar now on over 250 of its stores. Its goal is to have solar on 1,000 of its stores and to become 100% reliant upon renewable energy. They didn't specify the date, but it's a laudable general ambition. Um, we're also finding solar on some interesting places. The National Football League, also not necessarily what one would think of as a, the cutting edge of environmentalism, has decided that solar is a way to go. A half dozen stadiums today now have solar on them. Gillette Stadium is one of them. Um, I went there actually, I think, uh, to watch a Taylor Swift concert with my daughters. And I believe I was the only person among those many, many, many people who was there more enthused about the solar array than about the performer. Um, but this particular facility, FedEx Field outside of Washington, home of the Redskins, had a particular problem when um, they decided to install solar on the parking array in the parking lot of the facility. Can any of you guess what the particular problem might have been? That's interesting, um, but no. Close, okay, so tailgating. So what do people do at tailgate parties? They toss footballs, right? And so what they wanted to do was design the solar canopies so that they were high enough that they weren't going to have footballs crashing down on them on a regular basis. Um, these solar canopies today are the most coveted parking spots at FedEx Field because they're shaded. Um, and so they serve a wonderful dual function of providing shading and providing great solar power. Um, on a less kind of iconic, less, you could say, symbolic level, but on a much more profound level, we're seeing solar installed on warehouse roofs. These are roofs that you generally don't see unless you're flying over them because they're generally in large industrial areas like this one. This is Carter at New Jersey. It's the White Rose Food Storage Warehouse. It's a building that's a quarter of a mile long, high energy use because of a lot of refrigeration and uh, chilling. 90% um, of this facility's power now comes from the sun because of the solar array that has been placed on its roof. Um, and if you really want to get into the kind of gritty aspects of solar, it's really important to look at brownfields, what's happening on our brownfields. Brownfields, I'm sure you know, are either contaminated or potentially contaminated properties. They can be former landfills, mining areas, former factory sites. Um, and the uh, USA, US EPA has a division called Repowering America's Land. And it did a very careful initial survey of about 100,000 brownfield sites to determine what the solar potential of those sites might be. And they estimated that we could be getting about 6.7 terawatts of power from those facilities. And um, to translate that into terms that normal people understand, that's about three times our current total power use na nationwide. So this is just on our industrial brownfields. Now this isn't to say that this is the way to go because it can actually be fairly expensive to put solar on brownfields because of the site preparation costs, but it is a resource, a land resource that is not really being used for much else right now. And we are seeing brownfields developed in many areas. Dozens of landfills in Massachusetts now have solar. I visited a facility in New Bedford that's been built on a Superfund site, a very contaminated hazardous waste site. So it's a great match for not very desirable land and a very desirable clean energy resource. Um, the facility that you see here 
actually is on the south side of Chicago. It's in the West Pullman neighborhood, which is a high crime area that once was a thriving industrial area, now vacated by most of the industry that was there. Um, this particular site was occupied by International Harvester as an assembly site for its farm equipment. It pulled out in the early 80s and the site lay vacant and severely degraded until about 2008 when Exelon Corporation came in and decided to build a brownfield solar facility called Exelon City Solar. That facility um, is now up and running. It provides enough electricity for about 1,500 households. Um, it provided a good number of local jobs when it was being built, uh, including um, a metal workshop that was employed to build all of the mounting uh, stanchions for the solar arrays, which you can glean would be a goodly number for this particular facility. Um, I wish I could say this had solved the crime problems on the south side of Chicago. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been the case. In fact, the major cause of breakage of solar panels at this facility are stray bullets falling from the sky. So that problem has not been solved, but it did turn what was an environmental hazard, a safety hazard for local residents, and a visual blight into a positive economic and environmental amenity. But it's not just at individual sites that we're seeing solar developed. We're seeing entire towns, cities, and counties embrace solar power as an important part of their economic planning and their energy future. Um, a predictable example would be Marin County. Marin County, as probably most of you know, is a pretty upscale county right across the Golden Gate Bridge north of San Francisco. Um, they have something called Marin Clean Energy, which is a, it's called a community choice aggregation entity, which basically has wrested control over electricity sales from Pacific Gas and Electric, the giant investor-owned uh, utility out there, and it now directly markets to its customers either a what's called a light green option, which is 50% qualified renewable resources, or 100% the, the deep green option. It's a great system. Again, uh, this is an area that George Bush, the senior, called the domain of hot tubbers. So you perhaps expect that you might see something like this emerge in uh, Marin County. What, again, uh, interested me more was what has happened in a town or a city called Lancaster. How many of you have heard of Lancaster, California, not, not Pennsylvania? Very few. Okay, so this is a city in the uh, Mojave Desert, about 160,000 people. For a long time, it was known as a haven for gang warfare. Um, until 2008, when a very hardline law and order right wing Republican politician, former class action litigator named Rex Paris, was elected to office. Paris came in on a crime fighter platform, and he boasted to me that in his early years, 20,000 suspected gang members were put behind bars. And as he stated it, um, if you're a gang member, I don't care about the Constitution. It doesn't apply to you. Um, not exactly a warm, fuzzy, kind of progressive guy. However, that same dogged determination that he has applied to fighting crime in Lancaster, he's applied to developing solar power. Um, he talks about climate change in interesting terms. Again, for a Republican, um, he says it's a shame that the Republican Party has decided that climate change is off bounds. He sees it as a public safety concern, so there's a certain nexus to the crime fighter nexus, to the crime fighter issue. Um, and at a conference not so long ago in China, he stood up and to the consternation of his staff, declared to the assembled dignitaries, many of whom represented Chinese cities that had probably 30 times as many people as Lancaster, California, um, that his city, which none of them had heard of, was going to become the solar capital of the world. So his staff was kind of taken aback, but when they went back home, they set to work trying to make this boast a reality, and they did a whole variety of things. They put solar on virtually every school, on other public buildings, on the local ball field. They encouraged local businesses to install solar, and they passed a number of local ordinances, one of which 
requires that every new residential unit built in Lancaster has to have solar on its roof. Or if it can't have solar on its roof, it has to have off-site solar that provides power to that home. Um, so that's a very important step. Um, they also have utility scale solar built on fields within the municipal boundaries, um, uh, but outside the built area. And it's estimated that within the next year or two, Lancaster will become a net solar energy exporter, which is a pretty impressive achievement. So Rex Paris is going to be accomplishing what he said he would accomplish. Uh, there may be other rivals for that title, but he's doing a pretty damn good job. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for building solar within our urban fabric. Um, there are also some limitations, and I encountered those limitations when I visited my daughter, Maya, at George Washington University, and I asked her, do you know of any solar installations on your campus? This was back in the fall of 2013. And she said, well, I know of one solar installation. And she took me to see this single solar panel, um, highly visible, much touted, uh, good enough to charge up a cell phone or two, not much else. She was underwhelmed, I was underwhelmed, and we were both discouraged when the glistening new uh, engineering center, a $300 million LEED Gold certified building, uh, opened up uh, in the early spring of 2014, uh, no solar on the roof. And I asked various university officials why, and they said, well, you know, DC has a very strict height limit, and if you were to put solar on this building, uh, you would violate the height limit. So we didn't want to lose a story of the building to solar energy. So I thought, okay, that's a plausible explanation, but again, pretty discouraging if that's the best that uh, this university can do. Um, happily, a couple of months later, I read in the news that GW, together with the GW Health Center and American University, was going to be buying up all of the solar power of three very large solar farms being built in North Carolina. With the power that is going to come from those facilities, uh, by 2017, GW will be getting more than half of its total power needs from the sun. Similar story for American University. Um, so I think GW has really redeemed itself. Um, I went online this morning to try to see if there had been some divest fossil fuels activities um, here on the uh, Tufts campus, indeed there has been. Um, I think an important counterpoint to the divest movement should be an invest movement where people begin to talk very actively about what can you do on your campuses or off campus to green up your carbon footprint, um, again, not just by dealing with the stocks that your university are holding, a very important piece of the puzzle, but the real hardware that could be installed that could make a very big difference to your campus um, and again to our global environment. Um, the North Carolina solar fields that I mentioned uh, are an example of solar being built outside the built environment. Um, those fields are built largely on farmland um, and uh, there is a growing debate about how and where and whether to build on what are called green fields as opposed to brown fields. Uh, this fairly brown field, green field, uh, is in uh, San Luis Obispo County, California. It's in an area called the Carrizo Plain, which some refer to as uh, California's Serengeti, which is a bit of hyperbole, but there are some creatures in this area that uh, the solar developer that um, developed this very large solar farm um, took great pains to protect. This farm, I should mention, it's called the California Valley Solar Ranch. It has enough electricity coming out of it to service all of the needs of about 100,000 California households on about 1,400 acres of land. So it's a pretty stupendous contribution to our energy supply. It also takes up a fair amount of real estate. And what the developers did before they began construction was they did a comprehensive biological survey of the area, determined what wildlife existed, and very carefully uh, removed the San Joaquin kit fox 
and the giant kangaroo rats that they found on the facility put the kangaroo rats in what they called temporary condos and built temporary dens for the, um, the kit fox. Once the facility was complete, they allowed these creatures to re-inhabit the site. Um, in addition, they uh, set aside 12,000 acres of land in permanent conservation easement, and they also built migratory corridors between the solar fields so that antelope and elk could traverse the area unimpeded. So they went to considerable lengths to minimize, not totally eliminate, but minimize the environmental footprint of this particular facility. And there are other facilities like it. Um, a tribe called the Moapa Paiute in southeastern Nevada um, is a very small tribe. It has less than 400 people, and it happens to have about 72,000 acres of land, and they've decided to develop solar power as part of their bet on the future. Um, they successfully fought for the closure of an adjacent coal-fired power plant, which was very seriously impacting their one residential community. It was located less than a mile away from their residential community. And they decided that solar power made a whole lot of sense. So they brought in an outside developer and they trained their own people to become biological monitors of the desert tortoise. The desert tortoise is a threatened species under the US Endangered Species Act. That's a one category lower than endangered. It has about 100,000 of these creatures are still left in the southwestern deserts. Um, but clearly, it's creatures to be protected. Um, they fitted these creatures, they found 75 of these tortoises on the site, fitted them with monitors, and transferred them to a 6,000-acre conservation site for the tortoises. Um, since that has happened, one tortoise has died in a coyote attack, which could have happened at the original site. So it's been a very successful translocation undertaking. Um, and this facility also, once complete, will be generating enough electric power for about 100,000 California households, and I say California because the Paiute will be selling their power to the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, there's another kind of solar power facility that you see on a utility scale. Um, how many of you have heard of concentrating solar power? Okay, so this is an example of concentrating solar power. It's the Crescent Dune facilities. It's located outside of um, Tonopah, Nevada, which once was a thriving silver mining town, now is a fairly derelict community. Um, so this facility brought jobs to that community, which was great. Um, it operates on the principle of heat rather than light, which has certain advantages and certain disadvantages. The, the advantages are um, you create, um, you generate um, a great deal of heat that is concentrated on the tower you see there heat up molten salt, which in turn can be stored in these very large um, storage vats and can be used to generate electricity via steam turbine when the sun isn't shining. So it surmounts the problem of photovoltaics, which is a kind of use it or lose it situation unless you have some sort of storage uh, capacity. The problem, as I'm sure you have heard, is that at some of these facilities, not Crescent Dunes because it's in the high desert plateau where there are very few birds, but in Riverside County, the Ivanpah facility uh, has ended up killing a lot of birds because of the very intense heat zone, flux as they call it, or death ray zone as some others call it, um, where birds get uh, literally cooked in the air when they're flying um, uh, in the wrong places. So these facilities do present a problem in terms of avian impacts. Um, one way to mitigate those impacts is to rely upon the same principle of uh, tapping the sun's thermal energy, but doing so using parabolic troughs, which concentrate the heat on a glass tube that contains an oil that in turn runs into a uh, transfer area where the heat is transferred to molten salt, which is stored just like it is at the other facility. So this is an encouraging way to go. Another problem, however, with concentrating solar power is the price. As you can see here, um, if you do nothing with coal and gas except burn it, it's cheaper than more or less any other kind of electric power in the six cent range. Photovoltaics are very close, as you can see here, between 7.2 and 8.6 cents 
Um, if you factor in the current uh, investment tax credit, which is a 30% investment tax credit for solar, then solar becomes directly competitive with gas plants. No one's really building new coal plants, so it's not so much of an issue. But you can see that concentrating solar power, CST with storage, is much more expensive, according to Lazard, um, between 11.8 and 13 cents uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. But another very reputable uh, entity, the Fraunhofer Institute, estimates much higher costs for concentrating solar power. So I don't think we're going to see lots of concentrating solar power facilities being built in the near future because of price, because of the avian impacts. Um, and there's one other issue with concentrating solar power, and that is it requires a very large contiguous area of land. Um, the diameter of this particular facility, again, this is Crescent Dunes, is about 1.75 miles, and there are 84 miles of access roads that are used to service the 10,000 plus mirrors or heliostats that focus the sun's uh, heat upon the receiving tower I showed you before. Uh, photovoltaic uh, facilities that rely upon, that are utility scale, are much better adapted to the landscape in that um, you don't have to have contiguity. So as you can see here, this is a facility in Somerset County, Maryland, and the areas that are circumscribed in uh, red are the solar fields, and the green areas are forested areas. So what they have done is they've basically taken farmland, converted to solar arrays, and left the forested areas intact. Um, a pretty good solution, especially in the Northeast, where it's fairly hard to find very large contiguous parcels where you could build a utility scale solar facility. Um, just one other comment before I get to that. Um, you know, we, we hear a lot of debate about solar on open spaces, and I think it's important when we're thinking about any renewable energy technology not to compare it to nothing, but to compare it to the alternatives, which is you know, what we do to our lands to extract coal, for example, um, even what we do to our farmlands. We now grow 80 million acres of corn in this country, and about 40% of that acreage goes to produce ethanol, which is a fuel that has very questionable environmental value. So we do have superabundant land resources. should also mention California, 160,000 acres are devoted to growing cotton in a state which is desperate for water resources. It's a very water-intensive crop. So if we look creatively at our agricultural land base and think about where solar might be the best fit, I think we have some real opportunities in our open spaces. That said, I want to go back for a few minutes to talk about what we can do within our built environment and what we could expect from our built environment. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which as it sounds is the government's laboratory to investigate renewable energy, um, has estimated that we could be getting about a fifth of our total power needs from the sun, which is a pretty stupendous contribution to our overall power supply. Just to give you a point of reference, nuclear power today provides about 19% of our total power needs. So that would be a great start in terms of tapping our, our solar resources. Um, there are constraints in terms of residential and rooftop uses in general. Um, the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, again, has estimated that between 22 and 25 percent or 27 percent of residential rooftops are appropriate for solar, and between 60 and 65 percent of commercial rooftops are appropriate for solar. So we're talking about a substantial fraction of our rooftops that we can use for solar. There are constraints in terms of orientation, in terms of shading. This is our next door neighbor's home. And as you can see, it is both shaded and there isn't really much roof space that you could tap to put solar arrays up. And a further problem is that a very substantial portion of our population lives in rental housing. So in Boston, for example, 60% of households are rental households. Statewide, it's about 38.5% of our households are rental households. Renters don't have the right to put things on their roofs, so that is a constraint. Um, a further constraint is what's already on roofs. Um, this is a rooftop in Washington, D.C., where you see air handling units, various electric um, equipment, and you see a running track. So you have various priorities that people attach to different uh, roof spaces. 
One of the solutions that is really developing just in the last year or two is what's called community solar or shared solar or solar gardens. And what happens here is a developer builds a solar facility, sells shares of that facility to subscribers. So you might want to buy the equivalent of one solar panel, five solar panels, 10 solar panels, and then you get the equivalent percentage of the output of that facility credited to your electric bill. So it works just the same as if it were in your home. Um, but if you're home constrained in terms of what you can do on solar, then with solar, then this is a great solution. This particular farm happens to be in Colorado. It's called the Venatucci Solar Farm. It has about 600 subscribers. Um, and it's on open land, um, but you don't have to just build community solar on open land. The Seattle Aquarium has a solar array on its roof that is a community solar array. Um, so we have opportunities, and I predict that pretty soon you're going to be seeing community solar come to an open plot of land or a rooftop near you. One other area I just want to touch upon is What's happening with low-income communities? Because getting solar into low-income low communities is not easy. Credit ratings are a problem in terms of people who might want to uh, buy a solar system via lease or via a power purchase agreement. Buying outright is out of the question. California is in the lead in this regard, as it is in so many regards vis-a-vis -vis renewable energy. It has required the major utilities in the state to spend $300 million over 10 years to install low-income solar on houses like this one. This is the Huang family. They live in the Bayview District of San Francisco. I watched a solar installation going in there. Um, a group of people from Salesforce came, volunteers, um, supervised by a nonprofit called Grid Alternatives. And at the end of a very short workday, this family had a solar array that now provides them with 90% of their electric power. Um, so that's a huge benefit to them in terms of trimming their electric bills, and it's also a big benefit to our environment. Um, multiplied many, many times over, this could be a great way to bring solar into low-income communities. I want to give you a very crass and um, rough sense of what solar's overall potential is in this country. This is a map that was prepared by Environment America, an advocacy group, using data from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And what the Environment America tried to do was determine what the multiplier would be of solar potential in individual states relative to current consumption of electricity. 19 states have more than 100 times the solar potential that would be needed to generate all of the electricity needs in those states. Another 15 states um, have between 25 and 100 times current solar consumption. So we're looking at a pretty stupendous resource. Um, and Massachusetts, I should mention, is not in the winner's circle. We, get, we have about two times our current consumption as solar potential, which makes it that much more impressive when you look at these numbers that Massachusetts ranks number five in the nation in installed solar capacity. Um, what I find interesting about this list is you'd expect to see California on the, on the list, you'd expect to see Arizona on the list, maybe Nevada. Um, New Jersey, number three. You know, small state, industrialized state, not exactly a state that you'd think of as super abundant in sunshine, but in fact it has enough to generate lots of solar. Um, and Massachusetts, which is doing a pretty respectable job. We could go a lot farther, um, but you can see that we're way ahead of Vermont and way ahead of Maine, even though uh, in the numbers I showed you before, both uh, Vermont and Maine do have considerable solar resources, so um, they could be doing a lot more than they are. Um, there is a lot we could be doing to transform our infrastructure um, such that we are tapping all of our solar resources. There are lots of challenges. One of the big challenges we face is getting utilities to think very differently about what their, their, their lot in life is, what their function is. Traditionally, utilities generate kilowatt hours and then sell those kilowatt hours. Um, and what we're now demanding of utilities is they become comprehensive energy services providers so that they're both providing energy efficiency services, 
They're providing solar services. They're providing a much more sophisticated way to store, manage, and use electricity. This is not a model that they welcome. They're fighting various solar policies tooth and nail in a number of different states. So there are a number of real serious battlegrounds getting, in getting solar introduced, especially what's called distributed generation solar, solar on our homes, solar on our businesses and the like, because they really do threaten the traditional centralized utility model. But there is a huge amount of potential that we could be tapping. My book, Harvest, Harness the Sun, um, really documents these various elements that you've gotten a taste of in this talk. And I welcome your comments and questions. Um, I should mention that this is on a recent weekend in Agunquit, Maine, where my family under duress was absorbed in reading Harness the Sun. I call this harnessing the sun while sitting in the shade. So thank you for listening and Okay. So questions, comments. Yes. So this is a very positive message and I think you enjoyed your talk a lot. So but whenever we start some new huge enterprise at a large scale, we always um um, there's always some environmental cost to it that is not being discussed until it's too late. Um, yeah, how do we deal with the need for you know, gallium and arsenic at a huge scale to you know, build these, these panels? So there are two different kinds of crudely stated solar panels. One are based upon crystalline silicon, which do not use toxics. The other are called thin film solar panels that do use some toxics. And there is a very serious question about, well, what do we do with all the waste, right? If we're going to be developing solar on a significant scale, we're going to be covering a lot of acreage and we're going to be using a lot of technology. Um, one solar developer said to me that it's lucky the sun is as diffused as it is because if it weren't, we would all be fricasseed. So we are talking about lots and lots of coverage, lots and lots of panels. Billions of panels, if we're looking out 25, 30, 40 years, we're talking about billions of panels that we're going to have to deal with as waste. And in this, as in many other areas, the European community is way ahead of us. In their uh, electronic waste directive, solar panels are already listed um, as requiring uh, proper disposal and proper recycling. By 2018, 80% of solar panels in Europe must be recycled. Um, there are issues with these thin film panels, but a lot of the toxics can be recovered. And if you're talking about crystalline silicon, you're basically talking about a very, very one of the most common minerals on Earth. Um, and you're talking about uh, metal framing, for example, which can be recycled. Glass, which um, may or may not be economical to recycle, but it's not toxic. Um, there is certainly a problem, a challenge to be addressed. I think one of the issues is going to be our system of federalism by which each state might want to develop its own solar waste laws. And so you might end up with one state becoming a dumping ground for another state's solar waste. That could also be a problem, frankly, with our exporting solar waste and that we are not signatories to the international convention that deals with hazardous waste called the Basel Convention. Um, so we might end up shipping a lot of our solar waste to God knows where. Um, these are issues that we're going to have to contend with. Um, but again, I think what we have to look at is the overall uh, impact of this technology compared to burning more coal, burning more gas, um, the incumbent risks of nuclear power, and make some responsible choices in terms of what it is that we feel we can do to reduce our climate footprint uh, while still maintaining a quality of life that we all apparently want to maintain. Another question? Oh, oh, is that right? I'm sorry. Okay. I just want to ask about the criticism that got on microclimate impact of the solar panels. So, you might be replacing some area, even even really you know, bad quality or contaminated grass with you know, a whole bunch of large uh, black things. Um, how much heat is produced by an enormous uh, array of Right, right. Um, there has been some study of this. 
And um, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a natural scientist, so I can't tell you exactly what the impacts would be. Um, there are various ways to take advantage of the real estate on which you're putting solar panels. Um, for example, I talked to someone recently from Minnesota who is very actively developing pollinator gardens in the uh, rows between solar, solar panels. Um, it's a great way to repopulate our, our, our bee communities. Um, and uh, I, I can't give you a good answer in terms of what exactly the, the heat impacts would be, but um, as far as I understand it, they would be fairly minimal. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess that would probably not approve the project. Correct. What would be Okay, so the question was what are the financial dimensions of the Exelon City Solar Project? One of the advantages that that project thought it would have was a very large federal grant. In, in fact, the grant didn't come through. And so Exelon went ahead with the project. I frankly think it went ahead with it as much as a public relations uh, gesture as an economically um, smart investment in that it did cost a fair amount to remediate the property. Because it's be this is a property that's being used for solar as opposed to residential or com commercial um, uses, um, the level of remediation that had to happen was much, much lower than it would have been if you were to really remediate it so that it could be viable real estate property. Um, but they did spend about a fair amount of money on the property. And this is where landfills can be an advantage in that unless you have to fundamentally reshape the, the land mass, um, you don't have to do a lot of remediation as long as you don't penetrate the soil. So what a lot of, for example, landfill solar projects do is they use concrete ballasts to hold down the panels as opposed to drilling poles into the ground, which create obviously points of access to underlying pollutants. Um, so various companies are developing landfill projects, for example, because they make economic sense. I don't necessarily think the Exelon City Solar Project the dollars and cents would have made a whole lot of, um, been a very strong justification. Yes? I was wondering if you could speak for a second about storage ability, storage capacity for solar, you know, the constant uh, tractor of night and shade and things like that. Could we really have solar as our main energy? Yeah. Okay. So the question is how much storage would we need and what kind of storage would we need to make solar viable on a very large scale? Um, this goes back to the whole question of how do we view utilities? Are they power generating monoliths or are they much more broadly defined? And how do we function ourselves in terms of our effective and smart use of the energy that we need and the energy that we can store in our homes? So for example, um, if we were to build up a very large fleet of electric vehicles, that could be a wonderful double use of a storage battery. Storage batteries are still somewhat expensive, although the price is coming way down. Um, but if we were to have millions and millions of cars, the average car is driven probably a half hour to an hour a day. So you have 23, 23 and a half hours, let's say, of time when that car is not moving, when it could be at the control of a utility, for example, to modulate um, drawing down on that battery when there's a need on the grid for supplementation charging when the power is particularly cheap. Um, what's happening in Texas today is actually quite interesting. Texas has so much wind power right now that it is literally giving away power at night. And so if you think about matching that with um, electric vehicles that would be charging at night and having solar fields that are um, developing um, Elect generating electricity during the day, um, you end up with an interesting kind of complementarity. Um, similarly, um, pump storage is a way that we can deal with excess power. Denmark today generates about 40% of its power from wind, and uh, obviously the wind does not blow constantly. So uh, when they are generating a surplus amount of electricity from wind, 
they ship that electricity to, not literally, but they transmit that um, power to Norway, which has a huge amount of hydro generating capacity and hydro storage capacity. And they pump water into storage reservoirs when the, the power is cheap. And the power looks like it's going to be expensive on the electric grid in Europe. They start generating the electricity and they pump it back into, into um, uh, the European grid. Um, I think there isn't one single answer. There, are, I think household-based storage is certainly one opportunity. Community-based storage, um, obviously utility scale storage is something that people are also talking about developing. They're also saying that once electric vehicle batteries degrade to a certain point that they're not very effective for use in the automotive sector, they could be um, stockpiled as batteries of batteries um, on a utility scale to provide Store, backup storage capacity. So I think we have to think broadly and we have to think in a multifaceted way about how we balance what is an intermittent, intermittent energy resource with other intermittent energy resources. So wind, one more point, which is that um, when the winds tend to blow more strongly at night than in the daytime in various areas, including let's say Wyoming. And if after sunset in California, when there is a need for peak power because everyone's home, you know, cooking, doing their dishes, et cetera, um, they won't have the solar capacity unless they've stored it, but they could be bringing in electricity from Wyoming. And they're talking about building some long range transmission lines to do just that. So um, I think our grid managers have to just get a lot more sophisticated about how they are blending the different sources of power and the different storage resources that we could be developing. Yes. As a consumer, I'm, I'm curious where you get the, your best information. Uh, Lower income, approach me about my roof. I'm big. I have a, a rooftop that faces east and west, and a hill that's to the east, and a tree on the east side. So I no way. No problem, we'll put it over here on the west side that's kind of blown, you know, just the plane to go. Came back three weeks later and said, Oh, my engineers are putting it on the east side, right in the shade of that tree, and it's going to work great. So, I guess my real question is as someone who's wanting to do this or thinking about doing this, how do you know if the company that you're about to engage with is, is doing its due diligence in terms of making sure that it makes sense on your house? Right. Or that, and that I'm not just committing myself to a 20-year contract with very low return. Yeah. So the question is, how do you make a responsible consumer choice about what company you use and how do you monitor the information that you're getting from that, that company? Um, first, this is an industry that is really in the takeoff phase. So we don't have the General Electrics or whatever it might be that have been around forever and ever, you know, trusted names. There are some giant companies that are well, there are some giant companies that are offering their services. Solar City, for example, is one that everyone's probably heard of. Um, the bigger companies are not necessarily the better companies. I have to say, we used a very small company. It has annual revenues of about ten million dollars a year, spread across multiple states, um, because I frankly wanted a degree of accountability, and also for purposes of writing the book, I wanted someone who could explain what was going on to me and you know, thorough terms, and I found that. Um, but I had another company come in before that company to give me an assessment of what we could do on our roof. Um, they went on Google Earth and took a very fine picture of our neighbor's roof and came in and presented this and said, well, this is what you can do. Oh, this isn't the right house. <laughs> you know? So um, obviously a degree of due diligence is needed on the part of both the installer and the consumer um, I think that what you need to do, and it's what we did, is you, you, you try out multiple companies and you use your own judgment as to whether you're being sold a bill of goods or whether you're being told a responsible story. Um, and I think you also have to look at not just where your house is today, but where it might be 20 years from now. So for example, we have a nice stand of river birches on the east side of our house, southeast side of our house, where we have some solar panels. Um, they were below the roof line when we install the system, you know, less and less so. So you're going to have to do some trimming on trees um, or not, depending upon what your trade-offs are. Um, 
Installing on the west roof, west side of a house, by the way, in California can be a very good thing because of peak pricing. Um, so you're getting late afternoon sun as opposed to the south, which is less, less so. Um, and uh, there is no, I don't know of a, I, I think that, for example, there's a Solar Energy Industries Association, but they would steer very far clear of choosing favorites because they want to be an inclusive agency. I don't know if in different, in different states there are um, screening, you know, consumer protection analyses going on right now. I think the industry is very, very young, and I would be surprised if that's happening yet. But it's a very good question. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, might solar end up being cited in a different manner than we see a lot of power plants being cited as in adjacent to environmental justice communities? Um, right. Yeah, right. I think one of the great things about solar is it is pretty benign um, in most of its applications. So rooftop solar uh, really doesn't affect the neighbors unless the neighbors have a huge aversion to the visual blight that solar panels cause. And there are some issues with homeowners associations in some states like Texas, for example. So utility scale, um, there is no adverse impact to living immediately adjacent to a solar facility. Um, in terms of health impacts, for example. Uh, I personally think that in the Pullman neighborhood that I showed you, having a solar facility as a neighborhood as opposed to a blighted wasteland is a significant improvement. And I didn't poll the neighbors, but my guess is that's basically what the neighbors would say. Um, solar plants are not forever. So for example, if for whatever reasons, real estate values in that particular area skyrocketed and 30 years from now, they wanted to pull up the solar plant and put in a mixed use development, they could do so. Um, I don't see the kind of exploitation happening with solar that has happened with the siting of gas and coal plants, for example. Um, and I think that the, the environmental justice challenge is actually getting solar into environmental justice communities on their rooftops or through community solar installations that they can have a discounted access to rather than, oh my God, you know, these poor people are gonna have a solar field as a neighbor. I just don't think that's gonna be a very real issue. Thank you so much. Sure, my pleasure. Stay tuned next week for looking for good news about global warming. Dan Grossman, environmental journalist. Thank you so much. For